Okay, so let's talk about the non-coercive paraphilias. I'm trying to squeeze in one last lecture before the anticipated arrival of one of my housemates. <laughs> so um, if you suddenly start hearing crazy dog barking, I apologize in advance. Okay, non-coercive paraphilias. Um, so remember, non-coercive means that you have a victim who either goes along with it or who doesn't know that they're um, being victimized. So I'm not my paraphilia isn't necessarily harming anyone that, that they know of. So fetishistic disorder. This is where you have an in, uh, inanimate object or non-sexual body, body part as your primary arouser. Common objects are things like feet. Now of course it can be totally you know normal, atypical, kinky, whatever to include you know sucking on toes or something like that as part of um, sexual behavior but what we're talking about here is a person who their primary sexual attraction is a non-sexual body part like feet um, shoes again I mean, I mean shoes are designed to be sexy right and but we're talking about a person who needs to sniff a worn shoe in order to become aroused um, underwear now again modern lingerie is designed to be attractive. That's why I put this picture of granny panties up because it's not about what the underwear actually looks like. It's the fact that it's been worn and in fact if it hasn't been laundered that would be even better. Um, there was a, this is not new, there was a guy who was stealing underwear off of people's, um, uh, what would you, I don't, what's even the word for it, laundry line, right? Out in the backyards, back in the 50s. Um, women would do the laundry, hang their garments out to dry and they'd come out and their underwear would be missing. And I, you can only imagine that their underwear had to look like this, right? Um, it doesn't matter what it looks like, it me it's the intimacy of the object. Legs, um, again not a sexual body part, can be attractive but not normally a sexual body part. And then remember media, um, things like silk and feathers and um, latex and hair and things like that can also be um, fetishistic objects. Now the thing with a fetishistic disorder is that the person needs this object or to fantasize about this object in order to become sexually aroused. So they um, you know, might be have a piece of silk that they um, feel and hold and rub on their genitals and, and things like that to become aroused. I mean, so they use the object either in fantasy or in reality to achieve arousal. With tran transvestic disorder, being a transvestite is where you have a person who becomes sexually aroused by the act of cross-dressing as the op opposite gender. So a transvestite might be a man who wears women's panties under his clothes. It's hardly ever a woman. Hardly ever is there a woman who becomes sexually aroused because she's wearing men's undergarments. Um, it's usually a man who um, has panties on underneath his race car driver gear, which actually happened. Um, and when he got in a crash, he, his biggest fear was they were going to cut off his um, suit and discover that he had panties on underneath. Um, so, but it's arousing to be wearing those, to know that I'm here in a business meeting and nobody knows I'm wearing a, a camisole and panties is like the, the arousal. It's not considered transvestically disordered to be, you know, cross-dresser, like a person who dresses up as the other sex. That's not a transvestite, that's a person who's a cross-dresser. And it's not considered transvestic disorder to be transgender. That a person who is a cross-dresser is not doing it to get sexually aroused. A person who is transgender is not doing it to become sexually aroused. That's the big de defining point is why are you dressing in the other sex's clothes? Um, usually the transvestite doesn't fully dress in the other sex's clothes either and so they'll have on the camisole and panties and then a full man's suit like or their race car driver suit or whatever they're wearing that everybody else sees and the the fun of the for the transvestite is knowing that nobody else knows that I have this on underneath that gives them like this sense of power and it makes it arousing so that's why cross-dresser and gen transgender that absolutely has nothing to do with it um, sexual masochism this is where the person needs to be experiencing either pain or humiliation. Um, so a lot of times it manifests in bondage and, and like I mentioned before a lot of atypical sexual behavior has to do with bondage and, and there are safe words and it's a game. Um, but a person who actually is a sexual ma masochist needs to 
literally be harmed. They need to be bleeding. They need to have marks left. Um, they need to not know whether their um, dominatrix or whatever is going to stop. They need to have that part. Um, you know, now, of course, in our atypical behavior, spanking would pop up as a sort of a masochistic behavior. But for a true masochist, it needs to be more in the line of, of um, beating. Dominance, you know, being made to crawl around and humiliated um, could be part of role play also. But in a masochist's arousal, it would need to be something like um, actual humiliation, actual subjugation, you know, making the person actually lick up something that could be a pathogen, you know, stuff like that. A type of sexual masochism is autoerotic asphyxiation, and um, that's where a person puts a noose around their neck and leans into it while masturbating. And um, supposedly, if you time it properly, just as you're about to lose consciousness, if you reach orgasm, it's supposed to pair together and make this, you know, like most amazing orgasm ever. Or you time it wrong and you lose consciousness and hang from the noose and people find you in your closet or wherever you were and you've died. So autoerotic asphyxiation is the most dangerous of all these um, masochistic behaviors because you have this, you know, you're doing it by yourself. You know, you may not do it right. And I don't know if right is the word I should have said. Um, it's very dangerous. So where do these paraphilias come from? Coercive, non-coercive, where do they come from? Well, if we go back to Freudian psychodynamic theory, he would say that, you know, we've either regressed and we're doing behaviors that might have been okay when we were little, like being attracted to a, a, a child might have been appropriate if we really were a child, right? Um, so maybe it's a regression or we've left some of our psychic energy behind at an earlier stage, so we've just become fixated. Um, the idea is that we revert back to sexual behaviors that we developed when we were children, like this little boy peeking through the window to see what somebody's doing. And when you're a kid, you're allowed to sort of peek and look and skulk around, but as an adult, you're not supposed to be doing that anymore. So Freud says, well, maybe some of these behaviors are childish behaviors that a person's still uh, manifesting. And he also pointed out that um, when kids are little and they're doing just normal sort of sex explorations and things like that, um, and their parents punish them, it's very traumatic for the child. And so their trauma um, then becomes, you know, causes some of their psychic energy to stay behind and becomes this, this sort of anchor um, that brings them back to this level of, you know, development where they are stuck. So Freud, all of his treatments, no matter what your disorder is, would be to try and figure out what you've got repressed. Like what happened when you were a child that caused the fixation of this behavior or to cause you to regress back to this stage of development. The goal of figuring out what's repressed is to help the person work through it so that they can realize that, you know, it wasn't their fault or um, they misinterpreted it. That's, you know, a fairly common experience with children is that something that seems really big and important when we were kids um, really isn't that big and important now that you're an adult. And so if we can work through that, then we can get past the disorder. Now, behavioral theory, this would be any kind of learning theory, um, assumes that, you know, there was some kind of pairing between sexual arousal and, let's say, you know, your fetish object. Some kind of pairing between sexual arousal and whatever it is that you are, you know, sort of fixated on as your object. Um, and so what ends up happening is that that object becomes associated with sex, and that can lead to a paraphilia. So see, he's dating a giant shoe. Um, his friend goes, believe me, Harry, it's become more than just another fetish. Um, the idea with behavioral theory is that you learn the associations, and as a result, you can unlearn them. We can unpair that. We can unassociate that. So um, paraphilias are learned, so they can be unlearned. So we can maybe put you through some aversion therapy. What's with the headband? It's a rubber band. Every time I drive myself nuts, I snap it. Nice bruise. Um, that's aversion therapy where you punish yourself for incorrect impulses. And of course, if you're the right kind of paraphilic, maybe that's good, right? If you're a masochist, you're like, awesome. 
I get to snap myself in the forehead with this rubber band, right? Um, there are different kinds of aversion therapy. Some of you might have seen a clockwork orange um, that included some aversion therapy for sexual impulses. I mean, there are a lot of different things that have been tried. For example, for pedophiles, they tried attaching electrodes to the pedophile's penis and then showing the pedophile pictures of prepubescent children. And if the penis started to become engorged, they would shock it. Um, interestingly, it worked while attached to an electrode. The pedophile learned to not become aroused, not to ha get an erection when looking at a picture of children. Um, problem is, as soon as you get out of the situation where you have electrodes on your penis, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, I'm probably not going to get shocked even if I get aroused by this child. So one of the problems with aversion therapy is if the punisher isn't right at hand, then you know that you're you're not going to get punished and so you can um, engage in the behavior without fear. So maybe more helpful would be things like counter conditioning where we're going to um, you know assume that the first thing happened there where you see the um, the dog has learned to um, respond to the bell with barks and growling. So we pair the um, bell with the high value treat that usually calms down the dog with you know gives them joy and anticipation you pair the the trigger with the thing that produces a counter response something that's inconsistent i can't be barking and growling and full of joy and anticipation at the same time so what we do is we we pair these two things together so that ultimately the dog will substitute the joy and anticipation for the barking and growling Okay, so of course we're not dogs, but what we would do in, in counter conditioning is um, substitute an appropriate response for an inappropriate response. So um, again, maybe we have a pedophile who's attracted to children, and um, if we pair the a, a picture of a child, which is a trigger for sexual arousal, with a, I don't know, ice cream cone that the pedophile would feel more relaxed than aroused about. Um, maybe we can ultimately substitute the, the sexual arousal response with more of a relaxed and playful response or something like that. Um, that's counter conditioning. Um, well, I don't have on here probably the best response, which is, um, I mean, the best treatment, the most effective treatment, which is um, basically a, po a positive reinforcement strategy where um, when the person be behaves in ways that are sexually appropriate they're rewarded and they're ignored or punished for in uh, inappropriate responses. Ignored is the most powerful thing to do. Um, reward the person for desirable behaviors and ignore the undesirable behaviors. And the idea is that the person will start working for the desirable outcome and um, will start eliminating the behaviors that are undesirable. Biological theory um, ties these, um, I'm going to have to pause for a second, I'll be right back. All right, sorry about that. Got people out of the house and everybody's calling. Okay, so obsessive compulsive disorder is one theory of how um, paraphilias develop. Obsessive compulsive disorder is thought to occur due to chemical imbalances in the brain. There's a little arrow pointing at the part of the brain. That what you're seeing right here is a slice of the brain and you're sort of like looking at this person from the front and what you're seeing is that that area that's really under and inside the center part of the brain gets overactive in a person who has an obsession with something. An obsession is a thought that you cannot get out of your head. And um, so a person with an obsession with latex just can't, they get stuck in a loop and cannot stop thinking about it and it's the only thing that they can until they satisfy that obsession with a compulsive act like buying some latex or wearing some latex or whatever they cannot they cannot move forward they're just obsessed with it so we can treat this with um, different kinds of medication antidepressants work fairly decently well. Um, GABA inhibitors, which GABA is a, a, a neurotransmitter that is really active in that area of the brain. Um, if we give you an inhibitor, then that'll quiet down that part of the brain. Cognitive behavioral therapy works really well for this disorder, by the way, for any kind of obsessive compulsive disorder, um, where you basically retrain your brain that 
the thing that you can't get out of your head is powerless. It's just an obsession. It doesn't matter whether latex ex exists in the world or not. It doesn't matter. Um, it's just an obsession and it can really, it works as well as medication. It takes a little bit more effort on the sufferer's part, but it works really well and cools down that area. And so you see there's a lot of red in the um, pre picture and a lot of the, you know, the red is gone and a lot of the yellow is even gone in the, in the post picture. And that's after cognitive behavioral therapy. So, man, and I was so close to finishing this before the phone rang. All right, so that covers our paraphilias, where they come from, what they are defined as, and how they can be treated. All right, so I will see you guys in our final chapter in our next segment.